three really diverse speakers um, at different stages of their career. So right from pre-doctoral pre-doctoral, so prior to doing a PhD, um, but also right up to uh, professorial le level. Um, and we've also got different specialities represented. So uh, Shivangi Medi is going to be speaking to us from the perspective of a local authority. She's part of a, a public health team in, in City and Hackney. Um, and then we've got Kat Lawrence, who's um, uh, uh, professional background is as a physiotherapist and she's currently doing a clinical doctoral research fellow funded by the N funded by the NHR and then we've got Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty who's the um, Deputy Director of NHR Health and Social Care Workforce Research Unit at King's College and and she's going to tell you about her her entry into research and has, has got a really interesting diverse history. So just to flag, this is part of a series of events. This is the first webinar, and we've got um, three more lined up covering um, issues of patient and public involvement, um, looking at research, uh, how you plan your research and what kinds of support you can draw on uh, right through to the end of the journey in terms of sharing your research and disseminating findings. Um, so we haven't put the dates up for that for those yet because they're only preliminary dates at the moment, but please check our website and look for updates. Um, and also, if you want to be kept up to date, then join our mailing list. Just contact us at the email um, you can see on the screen there. So I think we'll move, we can move on then straight to the to the first speaker. So I'm delighted to introduce um, Savangi Medi. And I'll hand over the floor to you, Shivangi. As uh, Angela has said, uh, my name is Shivangi Medi. I'm going to be talking about um, how I became research active. I'll start with a summary of my career um, and when I started getting the taste for research and how that's evolved over time since completing my master's in public health and starting my pre-doctoral fellowship at UCL. Um, as well as being a pre-doctoral fellow at UCL, I'm also a part-time senior public health specialist at Hackney Council. Uh, so I've been working within the local government sector since 2004. Um, just under six years ago, I joined the City and Hackney Public Health team, and I've covered various portfolios uh, in my time there, um, including domestic abuse prevention, alcohol licensing, sexual and reproductive health, and I'm currently the lead for tobacco control and smoking prevention. A couple of years ago, I completed my master's at Queen Mary, and I was lucky enough to be invited back there as a teaching assistant, which I did as a uh, for one term. Also since 2005, I've been a trustee of Ashiana Network, which is a local charity that empowers women, particularly from South Asian, Turkish or Middle Eastern backgrounds who've experienced gender-based violence. Um, and in March, 2020, I started my two year pre-doctoral fellowship at UCL. Now throughout my career, that research back has always been there, I'd say. I remember in my time in Wolfen Forest, um, I did staff surveys and the focus group, and that led to the formation of the council's first Black and Asian Minority Ethnic Staff Forum. I, when I first joined Hackney, I used uh, qualitative and quantitative methods to explore the experiences of lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans staff, and that led to the foundation of our Stonewall Workplace Equality Index work. Um, my appetite for research really grew during um, my master's at Queen Mary. Now, for one assignment, we had to design our own research proposal and we had free range on what health topic to focus on. And we had to think about the methodology we would propose and the research methods to use. We had to identify a theory as well. Um, and we also had to talk about what recommendations we would make. And at that time, that seemed really strange as we all had this assumption that you would have to complete to research study to make recommendations but it was this assignment that showed me that even at that initial planning stage of a research um, study and in, in this case a fictitious research study uh, this could lead to changes and I, I will talk a bit about that more later on. So at the time uh, during my public health role I was leading on sexual and reproductive health 
and um, the council was embarking on its program to improve the outcomes for young black men in Hackney. So I kind of combined these two topics for my um, research proposal. And um, so for the theory, I chose intersectionality. And that's because a key feature of this theory is acknowledging that individuals have multiple social identities, such as age, disability, class, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. Um, and these can um, uh, overlap and, it's, uh, and, and shape the extent of which discrimination um, is faced by an individual or, or a group. I then considered how intersectionality could fit throughout the research stages, including how the literature review was conducted uh, and thinking about the research strategies. Uh, and then looked at how an uh, intersectionality framework could be used for the methodology and how it could influence the research methods. Um, now, I'm someone that does like a good mixed method study, um, and that's what I wanted to propose. But there was a word limit on this assignment, so I, I couldn't cover both. So I focus uh, on the qualitative methods, suggesting uh, using focus groups and in, in depth um, interviews. I um, suggested an iterative approach. So using um, as more interviews were conducted, uh, transcribed and cozy, the themes are rising out of, from them. That might prompt to change uh, a need to change the guide for future um, interviews. Now, when it came to writing the recommendations, the thing that I was kind of really couldn't get my head around in the first place, it, it became this reflective exercise for me because I was proposing um, using an intersectionality framework, it made me considered about some of the uh, processes we were using within our team. Uh, so something like monitoring forms the, to record social demographic data. Um, I looked at the ethnicity question and white British was the first option. And I know that follows census 2011 data, but given the diversity of ethnic groups within Hackney, it made me realise, well, th this should actually be in alphabetical order. Now, this is um, not unique to Hackney, and I see it used by many organisations and in research studies. Uh, recently, I saw one where the order for the options for the sexual orientation question, it placed homosexual at, at, um, at first. And this could suggest to respondents that there's this hierarchy and a preconception of what the the majority of respondents are predicted to answer and I do think this is something we need to avoid. So I applied the learning from that assignment to my dissertation and when I, um, I, I examined the workplace health and well-being of iris advocates uh, and these are advocates who work with uh, survivors of domestic abuse within a GP setting um, I used structural empowerment theory to highlight how workforce factors influence an advocate's health and well-being, and I made policy recommendations for commissioners and providers of the service. I performed secondary data analysis. I carried primary research as well by conducting in-depth interviews with, with the advocates. So I transcribed those interviews, and that took a lot longer than I thought it would. So a 60-minute interview probably took me around eight hours to fully transcribe. And then on top of that, I had to code the data and use the thematic approach to draw out some of the key themes. And I used an iterative approach and that proved really useful because it made me address some of my own assumptions of what I thought the issues would be. And actually in my research, those issues didn't actually play out. So I used the learning I gained from this dissertation to make improvements in my own work. So I was managing a small team at the time and I realised I needed to give my staff more autonomy to enable them to feel more empowered. Um, I also became more active in the team in terms of organising activities to promote better workplace health. I even formed a badminton club. Um, I also use the learning to think about specific requirements and service specifications for commission services to identify the health and well-being needs of staff. So in contract review meetings, particularly since the start of the pandemic, um, I always ask about the health and well-being of staff delivering our services. So as part of my local government role, I often examine existing research when developing business cases and commissioning new services or interventions. So I've often wondered what it would be like to be a part of a research team conducting these studies. 
And also, although it was really challenging, especially as I was working full time for Hackney, I really did enjoy my master's. And when it finished, it felt like I was having withdrawal symptoms. So when um, the School of Public Health Research launched its pre-doctoral fellowship, I jumped at the chance. Uh, so it was launched in 2019. It's a two year fellowship and it allows fellows to have access to uh, a number of training courses um, and the networking with other researchers is amazing. Uh, it allows it, you to work on pre-existing research projects and the kind of wider aims is to enable someone to gain that academic research and help them prepare for a PhD or funding application. So I'm currently exploring interventions aimed at chlamydia retesting. I initially did a literature review as part of a wider research project, and we realized it would actually be useful to conduct a systematic review. Now, this is something I've not done before, and it's been a really useful learning curve for me to understand how even just the protocol of a systematic reviews are formed, and then how uh, reviews are actually conducted. Even um, understanding the publication process has been quite fascinating. So why chlamydia retesting, you might ask? Well, chlamydia is the most common STI in uh, the UK. Repeat infections of chlamydia can pose serious health issues, including infertility. Reinfection is particularly common for young adults, but despite national guidelines, retesting rates remain low. Now, as a former commissioner of sexual health services, I'm also aware of the financial costs associated with the treatment of chlamydia. So this work is relevant to healthcare providers providers and commissioners as it will contribute to the wider priorities to stop the rise in SDIs. So uh, just to give some reflections since I started uh, the pre-doctoral fellowship. So being able to gain um, academic research experience while still working within a local authority has really been an amazing opportunity for me. Um, I have one-to-ones with a uh, one to one supervision with a senior research fellow and along with the mentoring and networking opportunities with other researchers that's been so insightful and having access to high quality training has felt like a luxury um, it's these opportunities that have really helped develop my research skills and i've already started to implement some of my learning in my local authority role there have been some uh, challenges along the way, particularly with balancing my different roles and the impact of COVID-19 has certainly magnified that. Um, and I've had to learn how to adapt my writing skills uh, for a different purpose and a different audience. And that's been particularly relevant for funding applications. Um, and one of my biggest challenges was uh, being able to decide what topic to focus on for future research. Um, my various roles have given me exposure to many interesting topics. And it feels it felt very difficult just to pick one of them, but something this pre-doctoral fellowship has allowed me to do is to really think about what I'm passionate about and what I want to focus on. And it's kind of given me that justification to focus on sexual and reproductive health. So just to leave, leave you with a couple of uh, tips. So if you have a research idea, refine it so you can deliver it in a kind of one minute elevator pitch and you can get bonus points if you can deliver it to friends and families or or people who have no idea what your research topic's about and if you can get them to understand it in that minute that's that's good um involve people in your research right from the start so research I, I think really shouldn't be done in isolation something I'm trying to do is um, to send earlier drafts on things so even if you only have a couple of sentences for your research idea share it with someone who can help uh, develop it uh, you know rather than waiting in hope that you're going to develop it yourself get that conversation going now um, we know that planning is fundamental and it should be part of that kind of plan do um, review and improve cycle and as part of your planning um, you need to manage expectations and that includes managing your own expectations and whether you're planning on doing research in addition to other work or not we all have multiple roles so it's really important to set those boundaries and really stick to them. Challenging your own assumptions is something you'd really need to do as well. So let your research lead you to the findings uh, and not to not to try to confirm your own assumptions over things. And finally, keep reflecting at all stages of your research. So as I mentioned, even at that design, design stage of a research study, that can lead to important changes even to your own personal life. So it's definitely worthwhile doing. 
so um, thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. And if you do want to connect, please feel free to uh, email me and um, best of luck for your research plans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shivangi. That was um, really, really interesting to hear about your uh, your uh, career history and how you got into research and, and uh, all about the fantastic work you're doing now. Really, really highlighted um, to me, um, I mean, the, the key value of um, those involved in delivering health and social care in whatever organisation, the importance of, of you doing research because you know what the priorities are, you are connected to your local populations. And as a commissioner, as you said, uh, re you, you've got really powerful inside knowledge about what some of the key issues are. Um, and, and to have that translated in, into research is really fantastic. Um, so Kat, are you ready to share your screen? your screen yeah that's great I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you thank you can you see that yeah lovely yeah. thank you um so morning everybody uh my name is Kat and um as Angela introduced earlier I am a clinical doctoral research fellow um, and a specialist physiotherapist specializing in critical care and so I wanted to take the opportunity um, to talk a little bit about my reflections on Intenabangi, kind of reflecting on my journey so far um, and how I have kind of adapted um, and changed my route um, as I've gone along. So before I move on to the next slide, I just want you to remember the image on the left, particularly the top one, so the kind of up and down of the of the journey. Um, so this is just a brief overview or a summary of, of my journey so far. And whilst I know that um, the image depicts kind of up and down, everything looks pretty linear. It looks like everything happens at a set time point. And so that's why I wanted you to remember that image from my first slide. Um, because I think we can all agree, and from all of our experiences professionally and personally, that unfortunately things rarely happen like that. Um, so how I've kind of structured this presentation is I'm going to focus on each of these key milestones. Um, and then within the presentation itself, I've given three top tips um, from that stage. So looking back and reflecting on it myself, top tips um, that I would give to anybody at that stage in their career. Um, and then three practical examples of what that looks like for me um, as a researcher and as a clinician. So I will talk about each of these key milestones um, as we move through the presentation. So thinking first of all about sparking an interest. So for me, this was when I was newly qualified. So a new graduate physiotherapist working between um, different rotations, so different clinical areas, um, and very novice both clinically, but also in the research field. So the top tips that I came up with here were explore existing opportunities, so look both locally and further afield, find colleagues who inspire you, talk to them, ask them to mentor you, um, and really don't be afraid to get involved. I think there's never, it's never too early to um, get involved in different areas and to find out what interests you. So I like to think about research and kind of involvement in research as a barometer. So not everybody is going to want to do a fellowship or a PhD or lead on an RCT. But I think everybody has a responsibility within health and care and applied health research to have an awareness of research, to critique um, research in your field, to use it to support your practice and um, to develop you as a professional, whatever your role is. Um, and so really use those early stages to find out what interests you. Um, because if you're not interested in something, um, then it becomes a lot harder to do and it, it becomes a lot harder to commit yourself. So some examples of how um, I sparked my own interest at this stage was joining journal clubs, local research networks. So dipping my toe in and trying to see what things um, interested me. 
So I got involved in some um, larger projects, but on a very small scale from, from my perspective. So I collected data for a World Health Organization project that was running at my local trust. Um, I contributed to national audits and just really started to develop those skills and see whether I wanted to be um, research aware and or whether I wanted to develop um, more of a career in research. So don't be afraid to ask and get involved in other people's projects um, and find those colleagues, as I said, that inspire you and seek out mentoring relationships. Um, because as Shivangi said, we really need to work together and collaborate as early as possible um, because no research is done um, individually. So I dipped my toe in and decided that I quite liked asking questions and I was very curious and always wanted to know why or more. Um, and so at that point, I felt like I wanted to do a little bit more research and try and understand um, if this was something that was for me. So this is the stage, so after um, about four years of working as a clinician and um, different involvement in projects, I embarked on a Master of Research degree. Um, so this was a studentship where I applied um, and um, had a year out of clinical practice to really develop um, some research skills. So we did master's modules and also a wider um, research project. And it was a really great opportunity to start to develop those skills um, and to think about areas where I wanted to know more. And my key top tips for this stage would be don't wait for invitations. So I think sometimes we always think that lots of people must just get asked to do lots of things but actually most of the opportunities that I forged out particularly at the beginning stages of my career were through asking can I help with that I'd really like to be involved with that how can I help um, because that gives you the opportunity to try and to develop those skills but don't be afraid to ask um, don't be afraid if you end up with more questions than answers um, that is research, um, as I'm sure everybody here today would agree. Um, and broaden your knowledge. So try at this stage to really think broadly, what are the different research methods? Um, what are the different topics? Um, and so that you can really hone down what you want to think about. You need to think more broadly to begin with tips were that I sought lecturing opportunities. So at first I stuck with things that I was confident in, so lecturing on physiotherapy modules um, and then moving to kind of critical care, which I was developing specialist interest in, and then building um, into it lecturing on kind of research and supporting and teaching on research activities as you develop your confidence. But all of those skills, so presenting, um, gathering evidence and reporting, rationale, um, all help um, to support you developing your research career. Offer to co-supervise and support smaller projects. So pay it forward um, from your kind of early mentorship. Start to think about supporting budding researchers um, and getting involved in those different projects to give you that broader view. And then read. So read a range of research outputs, look at different ways that people present things, um, and this will really help um, to develop your skills. Um, so now there's so many, there's a kind of breadth of resource available online through webinars and different training. So really utilize those um, and find out um, skills and things that interest you and things that you want to find out more on. Um, so at this point in my career, after completing the, the master's, I really felt it was time to focus back clinically. Um, so I put the research for a little while in terms of any protected time. And I embarked on a, a team leader position um, as a physiotherapist. Um, but I think that this has only strengthened my current um, research journey and really helps me to develop skills in both leading clinically, but also in the research um, arena. So my tips here would be to seek out like-minded people. Um, we know that teams need to be diverse and we need to, um, the best teams have people that kind of work in different ways. 
But if you're interested in change and improvement and research, find people that can help support you with that and kind of really foster um, that improvement culture. Develop networks and communities um, so that you can experience and discuss the kind of different aspects of the journey. So any rejections or any things that didn't go quite as well as planned, having that community of, of researchers and people um, who are interested in similar fields will really help at that stage. Champion yourself. Um, I think it's really important that you feel that you are entitled to a seat at the table and that we should all be invited to discuss and to champion improvement and change within our organisations. So don't be afraid to champion yourself. And if you've had no for an answer, whether it's for a fellowship or whether it's for a, um, a particular research opportunity, you know, take some time to reflect on that, but don't be afraid to try again. Um, so my experience of this would be, um, so at a trust level, I started to try and join strategy groups, so things that were focusing on research. So for me, I'm very passionate about allied health professionals um, and feel that there's a number of us that are underrepresented in the research domain. So trying to get involved in those conversations and making sure um, that we had a voice at the trust um, kind of strategy and development for that. If a network doesn't exist, then create your own, um, and that can be within your or broader, and then share your work at every opportunity. So this is that championing yourself, sharing whether it's a research project um, or a development of a network. Um, it comes from that sharing and that collaborating. So don't be afraid um, to share what you have to say and what you found um, with other people. Um, so after developing in my clinical role, I then moved on to a pre-doctoral fellowship um, where I applied um, with the clerk um, for a pre-doctoral fellowship, which was a year long and four days of um, research and one day of clinical. So this was a real point where I was able to try and find how a balance between clinical and research might work. Um, for me, but in a nice and protected environment. Um, and the things that I learned during this point were really to start to push myself outside of my comfort zone. Um, I was probably at the point where I would happily present on things I was really confident in, and then I would shy away from teaching or lecturing on things that I found challenging. And actually, that's the point where you learn the most if you can adapt and describe things that are complicated to you um, and as Shivangi said to explain them um, to people that are maybe non-specialist. Encourage yourself to take some time to write. I'm still very much working on that top tip um, but just take that time to write different things, posters, blogs, newsletters, so you start to develop those writing and editing skills and seek different experiences. So this was where I really tried to diversify um, the different things that I was involved in through committee roles and event organizing. Um, and my experiences for that were to start to peer review and edit um, for a local and specialist interest group, um, to join conference organizing committees, um, and then to join groups or find a writing buddy to really kind of hone those skills that I was. So looking to the future, so as I said at the beginning, I'm now um, a clinical doctoral research fellow, so I'm about 18 months in, um, and people keep asking me what I'm doing next, which is beginning to become more real and a, a little bit scary. Um, but I'm at the stage at the moment where I'm really trying to foster a culture of improvement and curiosity, particularly within my own department, but then more widely with allied health professionals within my trust. I think it's really important to take people with you on a journey. If you want to instigate change and improvement and inspire change, um, you need to take people along and make research accessible. Um, so in terms of my experiences within this. I have um, taken on research leadership roles within the trust um, through being clinical governance leads um, and leading on kind of project initiatives. 
Um, I'm now peer reviewing at a national level. Um, so that's developed from that local level that I started on my pre-doc. Um, I'm now a mentor and a co-supervisor on uh, for master's students. So really trying to develop those skills um, and give back and support people in the same way that I was supported. Um, and this is the point where I can kind of look and think about further funding and fellowship opportunities. Um, so moving from um, my doctoral to whether I want to look for postdoctoral bridging or whether I want to go back into clinical practice um, and continue with that full time. So thinking about those different decisions. So in summary, I think my key take home points would be to embrace each opportunity, to understand that things are not always going to go as planned, um, and so not to be afraid to fail. I don't like the word fail, but it's just don't be afraid if things don't go as you had first thought. It is likely that this will contribute to, to your development and your journey in a different way. And most importantly, um, which echoes everything Shivangi said, collaborate, work together, share um, and celebrate successes together because research is very much um, delivered by a team rather than an individual effort. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I am more than happy for people to contact me with any other questions and I look forward um, to some discussions now. Thanks very much, Kat. Um, that was that was great and really uh, complimented Shivangi's presentation as well. You really hi highlighted some of those um, skills that are more hidden in de in developing a research career. We often tend to focus on the technical aspects of doing research. Um, and sometimes it's very hard to describe that all of the other skills you need around that. Um, and, and I think you've illustrated those really, really well. So we've had some questions in the chat um, uh, and, and some great compliments for the, for the speakers as well. Um, please do continue to put questions in the chat. But I wanted to, to kick off the panel really by uh, welcoming Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty. Uh, I wondered, Anne-Marie, could you, you just share your um, journey into research uh, with us based on your, uh, your long and, and varied uh, career? Well, thank you very much, Angela, and I, I really echo the, the um, comments in the chat about the excellence of both those uh, presentations, different but complementary, and I found them really inspiring. Look, I'm not going to go through all the dynamics of, of my career, but I guess one of, the, um, one of the, the messages I would say is I, I sort of recognise um, elements and ingredients in Shivangi and Kat's presentation. I think they need to be uh, proactive and, you know, show a bit of gumption, as we would say, in, in research. If you want to, if that's what you want to do, then just go for it. Don't be shy. And one little episode from my career is I got the bug. I think Shivangi used that word. Um, early on as an undergraduate. I was an undergraduate in nursing studies at the University of Edinburgh. It was the first place in Europe to offer undergraduate degrees to, to nurses. Shows how old I am. And, um, and that had a research unit in it uh, as part of the, the, the department. So we were taught by researchers and we were actually able to attend research seminars. So I got inoculated, I'm not saying against um, in favour of uh, research from, a, from an early stage. And the first uh, research summer school was being held at Edinburgh at that time for nurses from across you know, Europe and elsewhere. And I had asked the director of the unit whether I could attend. Um, I mean, as a second year undergraduate, and it was probably a very bold thing to do, but she, you know, didn't say no, she said, okay, if you want to attend, you're going to have to come and do the catering for it because I couldn't pay the fee. So I just think it's, 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 you know, it's symptomatic of having a kind of mindset. If you want to do it, then again, find, seek out people who are going to be supportive, seek out supportive environments. And um, my first, ex, I guess, jump into research was 
very much. Um, I was loving my clinical job in Edinburgh, but an opportunity came up to do a clinical academic role in Nottingham. It was the first of its kind. And cut a long story short, I ended up uh, going there and doing a quantitative study at an RCT in, and designing an intervention, et cetera, uh, from scratch. So that was quite a, a learning, steep learning curve for me because I, you know, I'll have to say statistics is not my forte, but I, I, I did it. But at the end of that, um, MPhil by research, I decided that that part of the research world, I could do it, actually won a prize, the Nursing Times, you know, 3M Research Award. Um, but that wasn't for me. And then I switched tracks to study a long-standing passion of mine, which was history of medicine, of which we'd had a, a, a little dip into when I was an undergraduate as well. You see how important these formative kinds of experiences are and the people that you, that you meet. And so partly uh, I was hanging out with historians, you know, even as an undergraduate uh, at, at Edinburgh as well. So I decided, and it was a bit of a gamble, you know, to pursue that. I ended up doing my doctorate in history at Oxford, absolutely loved it. And I've used history as a sort of complement to understanding policy throughout my career, and professor of nursing policy. And I find this fit between, uh, you know, the Lego pieces, if you like, of history, policy and health services research to be incredibly helpful because they feed each other, they are synergistic. And ultimately, research is about, yes, poking around and structured curiosity, as one of Kat's slides demonstrates. But it's also, you know, it, like history, there's a lot of puzzle solution and, and, and almost jigsaw puzzle solving, putting the different pieces, building blocks of methods, which is what methods actually are, um, together in order to attack and, and solve a, a, a particular kind of problem. So, um, you know, I've ended up doing big data projects, having tried to get away from data, mixed methods. Um, I got pulled back into one, one of the, the biggest, the largest uh, nursing research study, I think probably ever con conducted in workforce, Kat had a, had a go at workforce too. And, um, and, and, but I still keep up my sort of history of recently just published a book on the uh, history of infection control and prevention called Germs and Governance. Doesn't sound a very sexy title, but it's got a wonderful photograph on the front uh, by the famous photographer Lee Miller of uh, a nurse with sterilizing gloves in an autoclave during the Second World War. Um, and so I've, I've managed to maintain those kinds of tracks of, of, of interest and use them to interrogate each other but I guess the point I'm making about which is following your passion and you know my kind of passion was and I can hear it in Kat and Shivangi too is about changing you change the world through research and you can actually make a difference you know in patient outcomes and indeed for systems as well and demonstrating that kind of leadership and raising the profile of our respective uh, professions and the constituents that we represent. I mean, Shivangi's case, people with domestic abuse and from, you know, a whole range of diverse kinds of backgrounds, really being an ally, our research is a kind of form of allyship for some of those, those groups. So look, I could bore for Scotland on that, but I'll just leave it there because I think the real priority now is to give the audience um, You've been very patient, an opportunity to ask some further questions. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, so, um, Sylvie, Anne or Charles, have you been uh, recording some of the questions that have been coming out? I've, I've just no I've noted down some, some topics where we've got um, uh, questions. Yep. There are um, a few. I've got them written down, but happy to go with the ones that you've noted first, Angela. Okay, so we've got we've got a couple of questions around funding. Um, so looking at across both of them, I wonder if, if the panel can say a bit more about their experiences of obtaining funding, particularly in terms of, of um, 
of how do you, how do you go about it and how do you find out what funding is available um, who's who's eligible uh, to apply for different sorts of funding and also there's a question about um, uh, research if if how do you how how do you obtain funding for research which perhaps isn't mainstream I think it was described in the question as a as being a more nuanced topic uh, that potentially um, may may not be eligible for funding for for whatever reason maybe it's not been identified as a priority um, and what do you do in those in those circumstances how can you persevere can you do it without funding so sorry that's quite a lot of a lot of issues but if, if each of you just want to um, share with us some reflections on obtaining funding, that would be great. Shall I just kick off briefly? Um, yeah, thank you. So um, funding is of course the dip most difficult part of research. It's, it's actually quite easy to have ideas I and mean, it's more difficult to turn them into research questions and researchable fundable kinds of questions and projects. But I think, um, you know, you have to really, and there's there's workshops on this, you have to really work up a grant. It's a, it's a very labour intensive, iterative kind of process. That word's been used quite a lot al already. And we all have to deal with rejection. So in order to, um, and you know, it's research, being a researcher, it's tough out there, it's highly competitive. And so you've got to have your ballast of support around you to help you deal with all of the, the zigzags that, that Kat showed on her stair, staircase to heaven, you know. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that persistence is absolutely key. Sometimes when you're rejected, you can take that grant and you can rework it up again. But, you know, you want to have a grant peer reviewed and absolutely gutted uh, every which way, taken apart and then put back together again, that's probably one of the most helpful uh, and important stages, which means you've got to leave enough time, lead in time. There's no point saying I've got a brilliant idea and it's due in tomorrow and expect that you're going to get funding. Flukishly, it may happen like that, but it's highly unlikely in, in today's kind of world. So you, I th there's a sort of art form to to writing and crafting grants you want to work with seasoned you know scholars and leaders mentors who've got that experience behind them but you know what you're not going to get a grant if you never put a grant in and you like all of us have had to deal with having multiple and most of our grants rejected you know that's the reality so you've got again it's you've just got to go for it but working with a, a really experienced seasoned team and getting a whole bunch of people to pile in and just, you know, rip your work apart and hopefully help you put it back together in, a, in a, an optimal way. That's my experience. But it's hard, yeah. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Kat or Shivangi, do you want to share your perspective? Yeah, I'll go next if that's all right, Shivangi. Um, so I guess I, the only thing that I would add would be to be creative and think about, again, that funding is a scale. So you could be looking for a grant, for a fellowship, for a really large project, or you could start by thinking about smaller pots of money and how you could make that work, particularly um, as I think um, someone described, um, Jill described in the chat about those nuanced um, and kind of more difficult to gain funding for um, research ideas. So there are lots of different um, pots of money through charities, through professional bodies, and then through the big funders. So the NIHR welcome. And it's also thinking about the spin that you're putting on the project. So for example, um, welcome have really developed a lot of um, research funding awards um, that um, focus on less of that clinical practice. So the NIHR for clinicians is traditionally the kind of clinical practice route and we can apply for funding to develop ideas um, to develop as both researchers and clinicians, but Welcome also have a lot of um, funding grants, but the focus there is more about theory and rationale um, and all of the funders and those awards 
um, have teams that you can contact. Um, so you can ring them up and say, this is what I was thinking. Does this sound in remit? There are no guarantees, of course. Um, and as Anne-Marie describes, we've all experienced rejections um, and things where it just wasn't the right fit, wasn't the right project. Um, so trying um, and, you know, if you apply for one funding, you can apply for multiple at the same time um, and just adapt that application. But thinking not just on the on the large scale, thinking about kind of trying to get different pots of money. So sometimes through your organization, um, innovation funds and things like that can also help with those smaller, more difficult to fund projects. Um, and I'm sure um, that Sylvie and Charles may send round um, some of the information um, that we have on those different funders and, and what that looks like, because it's hard to answer. I think one of the questions was, how do you apply and how are you eligible? There are hundreds of different um, funding streams available and those eligibility criteria are broad and wide ranging. So it's just an idea to, to have a look at some of the information about where to start. Um, but um, as Anne-Marie said, it's really about getting support from people who have done it before um, and just throwing your name in the hat and um, taking a deep breath if it doesn't work out and giving it a few days and, and trying again um, with a different funder. Thanks, Kat. And, and Shivangi? And kind of just uh, repeating um, what both Amory and Catherine have said, but certainly that kind of taking that collaborative approach, I think is really useful. And, um, you know, particularly if you're an early researcher, you're not necessarily going to know about all the various funding streams. But if you have an idea and you start talking to someone, they might remember, oh, yes, I, I saw a recent funding pot that's just opened up. And it's through having those early conversations that you can find out about various funding streams. So um, as I mentioned, yeah, in, in my presentation, have start those conversations quite early. Um, and in terms of um, funding for kind of nuance um, ideas, it almost goes back to that kind of having that um, elevator pitch approach. So if you can explain your research to someone who doesn't know your topic idea and explain why it's so important, that should really help you out. But certainly take that collaborative approach. I think that's quite key. Great, thank you. Um, so now a bit more of a technical question on the on the research itself and um, a question has been raised about about systematic reviews and at what point do you decide to do a systematic review and do you always need to do a to do a systematic review um i think shivangi you explicitly mentioned a systematic review in your presentation do you want to um give your perspective on that first Yes, so um, the, the research I'm doing as part of the pre-doctoral fellowship, it, the way the systematic review came about was initially just doing a, 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 a kind of a, a regular literature review. And we realised actually um, it's an area where it hasn't, a systematic review hadn't been done in, in, uh, in a while and it hadn't been focused in the UK. And um, there's been a lot of changes um, in chlamydia retesting since the last one was done. And so the rationale for doing a systematic review became stronger. Um, and in that time, there's been a number of studies. Um, so I don't think a systematic review is always needed. I think you need to pick and choose when, when to do them. And uh, certainly I, I was quite naive as to how complex systematic reviews were until I started doing one and, and realizing they do take a long time and um, the, it's, it, there's quite a lot of resources that go into it and even just the protocol stage of uh, you know ident how you're going to identify the research studies, how you're going to extract data, how you're going to analyze it uh, uh, and present your findings, even just that that kind of planning stage takes a while and then to go on to do the actual systematic review as well it, it can for some people it can take years even to do that um and uh it's something that you you know you, you can it will evolve as well you can add to your systematic review so um I think if there's a strong argument, if it's an area where you think actually there's quite a lot of research going on there, it would be good to collate that information together, then um, 
it's deciding whether that's just enough as a literature review or to do it in a more systematic way um, and, and whether that would help um, in terms of answering certain research questions, then certainly, yeah, a, a systematic review can be useful. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kat and Anne-Marie, do you have any quick, quick, anything quick to add to that? Because I just want to leave a bit of time for, for the final question. But if there's any anything burning you really want to add to that, please, please do. Well, can I just say, uh, make a confession here? I find the whole cottage industry of systematic narrative scoping reviews and the various distinctions between them um, confounding and very confusing. And it's, it's grown like topsy. I was just thinking as Shivanga was, was speaking, you know, we, did, we used to do literature reviews and it's like the whole ITization of knowledge um, has, you know, enabled this, this whole sphere of endeavor to kind of grow like topsy. And um, I, you know, I think it's a really interesting question. What are the relative merits of these different types of reviews and other true or such subtle distinctions between them that, the, that they're, they are really d different from each other? So, I mean, that's, that's my sort of hands up as a, as a kind of technophobe probably, and uh, someone who's not, not really been baptized into, the, into the, the techniques and the technologies. I'm a wee bit, I'm a wee bit skept, not, not skeptical of, of the outcomes, but as you say, Chivangi, the labor intensity of a systematic review, 18 months, you know, slog you're talking about, is that the best way? To winnow your 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 route through all of all of the literature. I mean, I'm not asking for a kind of frugal way into it or a quick and dirty way, but I think you know we've we've got to think about what real what is the benefit realization of some of these these strategies and these these approaches given the effort that goes into them. That's just a personal view. It's probably a blog or something or a rant. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it is. And, and I think there's a there's an art to systematic reviews as well as the, the science and technical bits. And and part of the art, I think, is knowing when to do one, when it's appropriate to do one and when it's appropriate to invest that much that much resource into them. Yeah. So so good good question from the audience. So we've we've only got one minute left, but I do I did really want to, to pose this to the panel, which is about how do you balance your clinical and research elements of your career and and balance other aspects of life in that as well. So quick, quick 30 second answers from, from all of you. Um, Kat, do you I'm, want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to start. I think um, that you just need to view it as an ever-evolving thing. So sometimes the clinical features or those professional elements will take priority. Um, and sometimes the research um, in terms of uh, the kind of priorities, I think that it, I don't think anyone's found the answer yet. So I'll be interested to hear Shivangi and Amri's. Um, but it is a constant juggling act and trying to decide at that time point what is the priority for you um, at that time. And that could well be personal life and um, other commitments um, and shelving research and professional things at that time. But I think I don't have a, a magic bullet. It's just a, a constant juggling act with competing priorities and deciding what's most important to you um, and your development and your well-being at that particular time. Shivangi, do you want to share your? Um, yeah, so it um, sort of similar to, to what Kat has said, but just add that it's kind of you know setting your boundaries, and they may um, evolve over time, and you know depending on what your kind of focus and your interest is at that point, you you might have to adapt them. But it's um, also sharing those boundaries with others. So I'm quite. Um, good with uh, with my colleagues in Hackney of uh, trying to make a distinction when I'm doing my research work and my local authority work and uh, you know there was that sense of guilt of uh, saying no to meetings but now sort of sharing those boundaries with my colleagues they know okay that Monday Tuesday it's my UCL time they're not going to put meetings in uh, and and 
being able to say no to uh, to things is quite a skill set sometimes. But uh, I think if you set your boundaries, manage your own expectations and, and try to stick to that, that can certainly help. But yeah, certainly um, I can certainly be better at um, setting those boundaries myself. And I certainly haven't found that the magic uh, solution to, to balancing it all. But it's certainly a learning and evolving process. Thanks, Shivang Shivangi and Anne Marie. Anything to add? Well, I, I, all I would say is it is one of the great the great challenges, um, especially managing multiple projects simultaneously, as as you will do as your career develops. And that prioritisation and competing prioritisations, as Kat suggested, um, are really really very tricky. That's why I think again being embedded in Research is a team sport, although I have to say historians are sometimes lone wolves. Um, but but in looking to the team, getting that support and see where there's some kind of slack where you can share and you can collaborate and be mentored into helping you make those strategic decisions. You don't have to do everything yourself. I think being part of an environment where you can bounce those ideas off and hopefully um, have a distributed approach. I mean, that sounds a little bit utopian, but this is how we all kind of manage our workloads. Um, and you have to say no. And, uh, you know, I say this as someone who suffers from FOMO, fear of missing out very, very badly. You know, FOMO and research and those competing priorities are, 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 are very acute tensions at time, times. But I think, yeah, learning that to manage demand yourself and self-regulate and expectations and those boundaries. Those are parts of the soft skills that I think should be taught as part of research leadership. And I think increasingly those skills are being taught. But of course, there's big issues around certain groups that do and do not get up to the top of the research tree because they have to make, you know, there's gen all the issues and in intersectionality that Shivangi mentioned beforehand are highly relevant to this kind of challenge and this task. So, I mean, I'm hoping that we can find ways of managing um, those kind of diversity and equality issues in, in a more optimal way um, than perhaps we, we, we're currently able to do at the moment. So no pressure, Shivangi Kat and Angela, looking to you for the future <laughs> and all our audience too. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. That I think that's a good point to end. Many apologies, we've got, we have gone slight, slightly over, but um, it was important to get all those questions in. Apologies if I've missed anything in the chat um, that came in came in a bit a bit later. Uh, but the speakers have all been very generous in saying that you can you can contact them to follow up. Um, we will send out relevant links. The, the presentation will be available to watch again as well. Um, so can I just thank again all of our speakers. Thank you for giving up your time this morning. It was really great. People have found them very inspirational and I've also learned a lot too. And can I also say thank you to Sylvie and Charles who've, who've done all the organisation here. And finally, thanks. Thanks to all of our audience for, for joining us this morning. And we hope to see you again at our next one on patient and public involvement. So bye for now. <laughs>